right, thanks for joining us. My name is Randall and I am the co-chair of this organization, the Pennsylvania Association for Rational Sexual Offense Laws. And I'm joined today by Teresa, who is the chair. And uh, I want to ask Teresa about how Parcel got started and, and get some of her thoughts on, on this movement uh, in this state and, and around the country. So Teresa, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Glad to be here. Tell a little bit of our story. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for your your work over these years, and it's been a, a pleasure knowing you for some time. And, and thanks for giving me the the guidance and, and help in, in in what we're trying to accomplish. Most welcome. It's been delightful to have you, and uh, I wish I could take some credit for all the talent and energy and uh, passion you have. But that uh, you came came to the table with that. Good deal. So, uh, you know, I'm wondering how, how this began, uh, but before we get into kind of the origin story, I guess, uh, if you wouldn't mind giving us uh, uh, the elevator speech of what is PARCEL? Yeah. Yeah. So PARCEL is an advocacy organization in Pennsylvania. Our focus is strictly on the state of Pennsylvania. And um, it is uh, an organization that is concerned with um, two things. One, prevention of sexual abuse, and importantly, uh, also wanting to make sure that the laws that govern laws and policies, procedures that govern folks who are convicted of sexual offenses are within the constitutional frame um, as well as effective. Hence, hence the focus on prevention. The uh, what we've got going now is not effective, and we have decades of research that indicates clearly that these things um, that we've put in place in order to protect the public don't work, and in fact may even contribute to more more uh, difficulties and abuse, including abuse. Yeah, that sounds about right, and uh, you know that's that's our our challenge and our mission is to to get that information out there and and uh, share what we know and and what the experts have have researched. So, how did you yourself, uh, Teresa, get plugged into this this area of advocacy? Yeah, so um, certainly wasn't anything on my radar screen. Um, however, I um, I I was I'll tell you, um, most of us. Most of us who are in this movement have uh, have a dog in this fight, if you will. Um, if it's not impacted us directly, um, it it is a family member, and the, and it is the case that I have a family member who was um, arrested and convicted of a sexual offense. Um, and when he came to me and told me what the restrictions were, I laughed at him. Um, because it was, I, I, it was so, what I heard was so absurd. I thought, surely he's joking. Um, and then I watched his face just drop, and realized he wasn't joking. And it just, it just was stunning to me that there would be these restrictions put on him or anyone, frankly. Um, so I did. A, I started doing some research. Curious. I, I was very curious, and I started doing some research, and I ran into two reports by the Human Rights Watch one that was focused on children on the registry and the other on adults on the registry and learned that in fact, what my son was, um, had to contend with was, was minimal compared to what most people in, 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 in had to contend with, which was even more stunning. It's like, are you kidding me? <laughs> this can't be happening. Um, and in fact it was, and I continued to do, to do the research and thought that surely there must be some something going on. Um, a group of people, perhaps, you know, criminal justice reform folks who were looking at these uh, policies and so tried to find someone in Pennsylvania and could not. There was literally no one in Pennsylvania. I did eventually, it took a while, but I did eventually find NARSAW, the National Association for Rational Sex Offense Laws, and reached out to them to the extent that I could. Um, I was very busy at the time, um, in school, full-time, working full-time, and um, 
there were a few opportunities to connect with people in Narsal, but they would have involved some extensive travel, um, in particular two of, two of their um, conferences I had to miss because of the distance and the time it would have taken. Um, and there was one opportunity to meet the executive director in Philadelphia, which would have been a two hour drive. She apparently at the time was trying to recruit. Um, there, was, there was nothing going on in Pennsylvania, as I mentioned, and um, she kind of planted herself in a hotel lobby in Philadelphia and sent out a message to everyone on their email list. Hey, I'll be in this at this hotel from this time to this time. This is what I look like. If you're interested in more, learning more about Narsol, please approach me. Um, and I thought, oh, wow, that would be great. And it was a two hour drive. That's four hours out of my day. Wasn't possible with what I had on my plate at that point in time. So, um, so didn't follow up with that. I did, um, the Narsol at the time did have uh, monthly phone calls um, where you could call in and they would have someone speaking about a particular area. You could listen in, you could ask questions. So I did use that opportunity to learn more about what was going on. Finally, um, they sent out an email um, saying that they would have a table at a, um, an event in just in, uh, I think it was Westchester. Yeah, it was Westchester, Pennsylvania, which was a bit closer to me. It was more like an hour away. So um, they were at um, DEF CON. So uh, DEF CON is uh, an organization, a criminal justice reform organization that focuses on people with who are deaf and in prison and the things that they have to contend with that are not accommodated for. Um, in the prison system. So I went to that event and had the pleasure of meeting the executive director, Brenda Jones, and who was then the regional director for, for Pennsylvania. Um, was able to have lunch with them, get to know them a little bit. They um, informed me about some possible opportunities um, within Narsol. And one of the, the one that, um, that seemed doable to me um, was to be a contact for Pennsylvania. So one of the things that Narsol does is they, they, have, um, they get calls from all over the country and they identify people in different states who are willing to be a contact, meaning you're, you're signing up for calls that come in from people in your state for your, you know, to have that information, that person's name and number passed on to you so you can follow up with them. And you might remember that's how we met, you and I met. I, I believe you contacted Narsol. Um, is, that, is that true or am I, did you get the number from somewhere else? I really don't remember if I, if I reached out to Parsol first or, or Narsol, one of those. Well, we, we didn't have, a, we were, there was no Parsol when you reached out. So it had to be Narsol. Yeah, so, so um, and that, that, that proved to be instrumental. Becoming a contact with Narsol really proved to be instrumental because up until that point, I was pretty much doing what I was doing completely alone. Um, and once I signed on with Narsol to be a contact for Pennsylvania, they did indeed pass when they would get contact, when they would be contacted by people in Pennsylvania, they would connect me with them. Um, many of them um, wanted to reach out and find out if there was anything going on, if there was any assistance that they might be able to uh, get in terms of housing or employment, ask questions about the registry and what it meant for them in particular. Um, and some wanted to call and, and just vent because it, it, is, it, is, it can be and is almost always just such a challenge for folks um, to, to live on the registry. Um, during, at that time too, there were a couple of really interesting Pennsylvania Supreme Court cases. One was Commonwealth versus Reed, and the other was the Muniz case, both of which challenged um, 
changes to the registry that had occurred because of AWA, which was implemented, the Adam Walsh Act, also known as SORNA, which was implemented in December of 2012 and changed things dramatically for people who were already on the registry at that time. Uh, for instance, my son who had been um, who had been ordered to be on the registry for 10 years was automatically shifted to lifetime. And that was not uncommon. That was that happened to a lot of people, thousands of people in the state. Um, so both of those cases challenged um, those changes and were successful. So I, I ended up getting a lot of calls from people who wanted to know more about that. You know, did would these particular cases make a difference for them, um, tell their stories. And also um, some people wanted to find out what they could do to help. Um, and so the first couple of calls I got from people who wanted to help um, was another mother. One was another mother and the other was a man who had recently been released from prison, who had been convicted of a sexual offense. And both of them really were very cool, very interested in doing something. What can we do? What can we do? It's like, I don't know. Let's get together and talk about that. So um, we did, we found kind of a central location and we met for lunch, the three of us, and started having the conversations about organizing. One of the other things that, um, that Narsal can support folks with is starting what they call an affiliate, which is what Parsol is. We are an affiliate of, um, or as, uh, you know, of, of Narsol, a proud, a proud affiliate of, of Narsol. And, and so we started talking about, okay, how do we do this? And none of us had any experience in these areas. We were all um, competent, capable people, but uh, we're kind of pulled into this arena because of our personal circumstances. We started to um, have these conversations. Um, other people called, a few other people called. Um, and, and interestingly, I, I'm always amazed at the, the different talents and strengths that all of these people, and it's not all of these people, I think, you know, all told it was like six, seven maybe, seven people total um, who all had very different strengths and brought something different to the table. And we, between us, um, you put us all together and you had one complete, complete, uh, <laughs> complete package in terms of what needed to be done to start an, an affiliate. So we all um, worked on pulling that together. We had um, our first official board meeting where um, since we were the only, it was seven people, I believe, the, we were the only people interested. And so we, we, we voted ourselves onto the board because there was no one else at that time um, to vote onto the, it, it vote into the, uh, onto the board. Um, I think that was in 20, uh, I'm looking at my notes. 2017, I wanna say. Yeah, I think it was 2017 that all of that started to happen. Um, we so we so we were official, if you will, um, and started started. Uh, we were I was able to attend a Narsal conference along with one of those other folks who was. We learned an, an awful lot. We started to try to prioritize what not just what we wanted to do, but what we could do. Frankly, um, no resources. Every single person was involved in something else, um, uh, e either caring for a family member or working full time. So time, our resources, time and money were quite limited. So we focused on what we actually could do. Um, and and we're, you know, I'm, kind of, I'm thinking back, we, we were able to tap into some folks who, who brought something different to the table, folks who had experience doing these kinds of things with nonprofits, starting nonprofits. And, um, and I'm remembering one of them saying to us at one of our meetings, we probably had been around, you know, officially, we had been parcel for about six months. And this person said that 
you know, it was unlikely that we would make it uh, more than two years. She said, you know, almost all nonprofits that start up fail within the first two years. So that wasn't real encouraging. Um, however, we, uh, we didn't let, us, let it deter us. We kept um, moving forward. And during that time, more people with, with more, more talents that were desperately needed started appearing. Um, you, Randall, were one of them. And um, you might remember that uh, it took a while to get you on board, but finally, you know, we were able to get it together enough to make that happen. And that, that happened with, uh, with, with a, a handful of folks. Some of the original board members kind of moved on. In some instances, uh, one in particular, uh, two people that were there at the very beginning was a husband and wife couple, and um, and they were very passionate and did 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 some some good work early on. However, the Muniz um, case provided the relief that this that the husband needed to get off the registry and he got off the registry and then they were no longer involved and that that's happened on a number of occasions um and and it's understandable this work is really hard it's so freaking hard it's not um you work really hard you're really passionate about it and nobody's looking to pat you on the back for trying to um to change laws the, the current sex offense laws because they believe that they work and they believe that this is important. And I understand that. Um, nonetheless, that narrative needs to change because it's completely false. So kind of puts, puts folks who do this work in a, in a place where when you're trying to balance your own life um, along with, again, many, many of the folks who do this volunteer work have challenges that the in addition to regular life challenges that are presented by the registry. Um, and then you're putting all this energy into something that, that is not really valued by most people you're gonna meet on the street um, or maybe even in your own family or friend circle, um, it, can, it can get hard. So, uh, you know, folks, I think um, there's been some folks who have come and gone and there's also been some folks who have stayed the course um, and continue to grow this organization in amazing, amazing ways. So we've been officially, um, we've been parcel officially, I guess, for six years. Um, and the, the, the makeup of, of the organization has changed. The focus has been fine-tuned I think in, in, uh, in a way that really makes great logical sense and, um, and also has the potential for making this, um, this state um, a better place for everybody. Thanks, Teresa. I sometimes describe myself <clears throat> as uh, <clears throat> a person when I see the, the painting on the wall and it's crooked, I straighten it. And uh -huh. some people, you know, are okay to just just walk by. So, you know, when I heard your story about getting involved with Narsal and and you doing it on your own for a, a while, you know, what why why did it have to be you? What drove you? What what uh why why was why was it you and not someone else? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I think I asked that question myself. Like, why me? Why me? Um, <laughs> And um, actually, interestingly, um, yeah, so I mean, part of it is um, it did directly impact me because it impacted my family so severely um, and, and still does to a lesser extent. We've been able to maneuver through it. And, um, you know, my son has a, has a wonderful life and a wonderful family and um, just recently last week was married and um just has a job that he enjoys and uh, bought a house last month and so you know over the years you know he's been able to to get through some immense challenges um nonetheless uh the the obstacles have been many and the um and the losses have been severe uh in in terms of of what he's had to endure to get to this point 
so so there was this personal thing, this personal um, buy-in. No no parent wants to see their child suffer. Um, and don't get me wrong, you know what he did was wrong, and he, and and there's no reason that he should not have been held accountable for it. However, the severity of of what the registry brings to the uh, to the experience of someone convicted of these kinds of, of crimes is way over the top. And again, importantly, doesn't frigging work. It's not success, they, it, it doesn't help um, to prevent sexual abuse on any level. It goes far beyond um, what needs to, you know, what someone should have to um, be subjected to as, as a form of punishment. Um, sorry, I'm getting a little, what was the question? <laughs> yeah, you know, sorry. I heard you say uh, that it, it affected you personally. So that was part of why it had to be you. Okay. Yeah, so it affected me personally. Um, and there was, you know, as I'm thinking, thinking back, I mean, it was just, it was just so unbelievable. Um, and certainly would not have there wasn't anything else. So it kind of had to be me. I'm, I'm experiencing this. My family is experiencing this. There is nothing that's happening. And I will say that um, I was inspired by the people at Narsaw. Um, you know, I had that first encounter in, um, at DEF CON and then uh, was able the following year to actually go to my first Narsaw conference and meet some amazing people, most of whom uh, were personally impacted by these laws from across the country. Um, one of one of who one of who I would uh, a person I would call my my one of my dearest friends was someone I met at that at that conference. Um, to have to be able to be there with other people who are having the same experiences um, and see what they had been doing in terms of advocacy in their states that was inspiring. So, I mean, part of why it had to be me was there was no one there. It impacted me directly. I had the good fortune of meeting these, you know, wonderful people who had been doing this advocacy work in other states for a number of years. Um, and they, so there was this network, you know, there was, there was this network that I was able to tie into and people I was able to learn from, to be able to, and to do something I think that has value. Uh, and, you know, I will tell you the truth, you know, I've been on both sides of this fence in terms of um, was sexually abused as a child. Um, it, it wasn't a prolonged, it was a, a, a one, one incident, um, and also as a young adult. Uh, so I know it, you know, I, I'm no fan of sexual abuse on any, on any level, and know that it's horrific and, um, and want like anyone wants for that to not happen to people anymore. Um, so this, you know, it, it really was infuriating to to under to see that that we have an opportunity to do something to prevent sexual abuse, and we're wasting all our resources on these systems that that do no good whatsoever in terms of prevention and harm many other people. So I don't think I've answered your question. I mean, who knows? It just, it's just the way my life unfolded. Um, I will say, you know, at the time I was in, uh, I was in graduate school working on a, a PhD and I had intended my dissertation to, um, I, was, I wanted to, my dissertation research to be focused on shared trauma. Um, and when all of this came down, I remember clearly sitting on my front porch and getting this, this kind of ta this knowledge, this inner wisdom thing that, that all of us have and that, that arises in us at times, um, it, it, it appeared and basically said, told me that no, you know, your research needs to be focused on, um, finding ways to help people deal with the psychological and spiritual trauma that occurs as a result of being on a public registry. 
um, that stigmatization and public shaming, that's what your research needs to be done on. And I remember literally, I was sitting on the porch, I was by myself, I looked up at this guy and said, I'm sorry, God, you got the wrong guy. It's exactly, you know, you're like, this is not what I wanted to be doing. This is not, you know, why I uh, signed up for this program. But, um, but it was, and that's, that is exactly what I did with my dissertation research as well. Um, one of, one of the problems, you know, with, with this is, you know, we force some um, people who've been convicted of these offenses to, uh, to, to live in certain places. That's usually because of probation. We'll, we'll, we'll thumbs up or thumbs down living arrangements um, based on any number of things. Um, they have difficulty getting into schools. There's a public registry. Um, some are harassed horribly. Um, you, I talk to people who walk down the street and don't, you know, and wonder, does that person know? Is that person looking at me funny because they're judging me? Um, they think I'm this or that. And, um, you know, it's walking around with that degree of stigmatization um, and, and the shame that comes from it is not good. And frankly, um, most folks are uh, mandated to be in treatment and, uh, and that, that treatment is sometimes good and often not. It's often shame-based itself. Um, and as someone who is um, interested in, I, I, I am a psychotherapist um, and it's very, very interested in the emotional, psychological and spiritual pain that, uh, that we as humans need to learn to maneuver in order to have fulfilling and uh, happy lives. Um, it just made sense for me to go in that direction. Um, to, it's like, okay, these, these folks are stuck in this situation. You know, is there a way that we can use some kind of approach to kind of help them manage uh, the shame, the depression, the religious crisis, all kinds of things that uh, that arise as a result of the, the the policies and laws. Thanks. So, did you have your uh, your PhD when you founded Narsol, or that happened after when you founded Parsol? That happened during. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You bring up treatment, and uh, we could get a, into a whole other interview, and and perhaps we can do that as far as uh, how Pennsylvania. And, and so many other states take their approach to treatment, in particular, the, the real, you know, controversial use of polygraphs. So I'd love to get your thoughts on that in, in another talk. But again, we could, we could talk for a long time on that. Um, so, you know, I heard you, you talk about getting in, introduced to this and, you know, not, the issue not exactly being on your radar before your family member brought it up to you. Uh, how have things changed in the last say 15 years, I feel like kind of the height of, of uh, vilification of, of people with these backgrounds uh, was around the, the to catch a predator time, somewhere around 2005, 2007. Yeah. Uh, and that does coincide with uh, the passage of uh, SORNA, which is federal legislation to try and uh, regulate or, or standardize registries, you know, across the 50 states. Uh, but it's been it's been 17 years now. So how have things changed since give or take 2005? Um, so I wasn't around 2005. Um, this kind I kind of got involved in this in 2011. So we'll we'll go for like a decade or so. Um, and uh, you. You know, I don't know that there was anything special about 2005. I think these these laws started, and that's probably a, a whole nother thing too, talking about the history of 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 SORNA and or these these kinds of policies. But I can tell you, when I got involved around two, 2011, um, the research that I did, the journal articles I read, the Human Rights Watch reports, the the advocates I eventually met and and talked to, um, the you know, did make a few um, visits to legislators to, you know, because I had this idea that surely if they knew, 
if everyone knew what the real, the facts are just like me, I mean, I'll tell you, um, before I was, before this happened to me, if, if I heard the, the phrase sex offender, I was stricken with fear and my threat system was automatically, um, fired up and, and all kinds of assumptions came to mind. And I was no different than anyone else until I did the research and realized what was actually happening, who were, who was actually on, on these lists. Don't get me wrong. There are people who have serious pathologies who need some, some, uh, a lot of support in order to not offend, but that's the, that's the vast uh, mi minority. It's a, it's a, it's a minority. The, the vast majority of people on the registry are, are, are little to no risk. Um, Anyway, I thought surely as soon as people know what, what the de real deal is, this will uh, change. But of course, um, I learned early on that no, it's it, no, people are, are, are really attached to this narrative. There's not a lot of opening. Um, when I, and when I first started this work, I was convinced that, that there would be no change in my lifetime. Now I'm old, so that's not a whole lot more time to go, but, um, but it became evident that nothing was going to change anytime soon or easily. Um, and I'm happy to say that there have been some major changes in, in, the, in the decade that I've been involved in this, some major changes. Um, the first thing that happened in Pennsylvania was there was um, uh, a, an appeals case that ended up making it to the Supreme Court started in York County um, and went up to the Supreme Court where um, minors, minor children were taken off of the registry. Pennsylvania is one of the few states in the country that no longer um, puts minors on the registry for the most part. Um, there, there, are, there are some rare cases when a child might be designated SVP, an SVP, a sexually violent predator, even that kind of makes me cringe. You know, children are developing, and there are all kinds of ways to help um, help them rather than just label them. Um, so that was the that was the first thing. It's like all the, all the kids off of the registry, yay! Um, and then the the read then things got worse with Awa, uh, in in. Um, and then things got better with the challenges to, to Awa being adopted by Pennsylvania. Um, so there was Reed and Muniz and there's continuing cases going on. It seems that we have one, uh, one of our board members um, is always thumping, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the litigation it's the appeals, it's the litigation where the change is gonna be made. And I think in large part, that's true. There's absolutely a place for legislative work, for education. Um, it, how, however, I think the major changes that I've seen have been um, in that, that arena with, of legislation. Um, other changes that have happened in the past 10 years, I guess the big change, and this is not something that just happened. Um, so the American Law Institute, the, their mon model penal code was, uh, will be finalized in the very, very near future. I can't remember exactly when it's within a month or two, um, it will be finalized and their recommendations um, basically are tied directly to all the research um, and what, and the major, not the major, but one of the recommendations is to do away with the public registry, that it is isn't effective. Um, they have limited, they've, they've outlined exactly what a model penal code for sexual offenses would look like based on solid, robust scientific um, research that's been done over the course of the past two decades. Um, now they have, that's, these are just recommendations. These recommendations never would have been made, you know, in, you know 20 years ago. Um, and it, it's, it's, I think it's worth noting that the ALI's recommendations have been in the making for at least 10 years. The ALI does not mess around. They do a deep dive into all the research. 
Um, they look at the academic research. They talk to people. Actually, they called Parsol um, about three years ago when they were working on on this, and they we were we were uh, one of the organizations that they interviewed while they were doing their research to uh, come up with the new recommendations. This is a big deal. Um, so, so the fact that they've been working on these uh, recommendations for some time means that there is a shift going on. Now, in, in, uh, it is said that it takes 10 years for research to hit the ground, to hit the reality. Um, now, I think for, in this case, it's, we're, we're talking about a lot more than 10 years because we're talking about really internalized narratives um, about people who have um, committed sexual offenses, then that's gonna take longer, but it's happening, right? It's happening. And the, the ALI recommendations um, is, it, 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 you know, it, I'm speechless because they're just phenomenal in terms of the shift in perception. And it's the first step um, in, in making that movement. It, it, uh, it, it's also interesting to note that the ALI recommendations throughout history are generally eventually adopted. And, and made into law. So this is a, this is a big deal. And, um, and the beginning, I think, of a wave and a shift into more rational sex offense laws. Yeah, the ALI, that, that has a, a lot of potential to, to make some change and encourage, encourage change. And you know, beyond that, I think one of the changes in the last 10 years, 15 years, is uh, some of these discussions are, are on the table. You know, you're, you're, you're allowed to make the argument that, you know, well, maybe these people are, uh, maybe they have been punished enough. And maybe these laws do need a, a second look at, you got attorneys generals in, uh, in, in some cities and some states who were willing to say that publicly. Uh, Justice Sotomayor had a, uh, a dissenting opinion recently and where she talked about, you know, the way that we really are. Uh, doing doing a disservice to, to to people who are trying to get their lives back on track after serving mm -hmm. their sentence. So yeah. yeah, I'd say that's that's one of the big changes too. It's it's kind of in in the public dialogue more. Yep, yep. It's uh, it, you know a sea change. It's it's the beginning of it, and I, I again never anticipated seeing that. 10 years ago, like, nah, not going to happen, but it's got to start somewhere, right? Yeah. Um, you know, Narsal has affiliates in, in a lot of states, but not all states. Uh, right. There are there are still some places where there is no no organization to, to advocate for this kind of change. Do you think Pennsylvania is unique in any way uh, as far as this this issue goes? Is, is the fight the same in, in the 49 other states and all the other territories? Yeah, I think it's different everywhere. There's a lot of similarities. We share some of the same challenges from state to state. Um, and, and there's also differences. Um, the challenge, some of the challenges are different. Now, one of the things we do have in Pennsylvania that's very different from other states is in Pennsylvania, we have uh, a constitutional right to reputation. Um, and that is, I think, a significant difference between um, Pennsylvania and other states in, in, in relation to what's going on with the public registry, um, it certainly is, pr provides an argument um, for doing away with the public registry. How in the world can your right to reputation be protected if there is this public website and um, with information that may or may not even be accurate? <laughs> Yeah, and that's uh, a video that uh, we have in the works. Uh, we're developing a script for that to talk about uh, the right to reputation. As you said, it's unique to Pennsylvania. And you know, for those of you who might like history, we're going to go back to all the way to uh, William Penn and you know mm -hmm. why why the right to reputation was so important to uh, the founder of this state. Well, Teresa, we've been going for a while now. Uh, just a few more questions here uh, to kind of wrap up. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who wants to see change in, in this area as far as sexual offense policy reform and, and 
uh, you know, a more rational approach to sex offense laws and and punishment and recovery and reentry. Yeah, yeah. So um, educate uh, yourselves. My, I mean, I'm still in the process. It, things are changing all the time. So it, it's kind of a, you know, learning more about what's going on um, is, is, is something we, that's constantly evolving and we never, um, we never kind of get a wrap on all of it. We have to stay up, uh, I, I would say stay, stay up to date on what's going on legislatively and also, um, support wise and reform wise, uh, find an organization <laughs> uh, or, you know, or maybe not an organization, find a handful of, of, uh, of folks who, you, this is not work that can be done alone. It takes, takes too much. When I first signed on to be a, a contact with Narsol and got on their affiliate mailing list, uh, people were saying, oh, welcome. And, um, and one of the people I, I remember, one of the emails said, stay strong. And I was like, what's that supposed to mean? You know, and I learned quickly what that meant. <laughs> Excuse me, what that meant. Uh, stay informed to the best of your ability. Find support, whether it's um, folks in your community who are sharing some, of, have some of these shared experiences or reaching out to an organization. Parcel runs a fearless group uh, once, a, once a month. It's the second two, Saturday of every every month. You can contact Parsol to get the link for that. Um, the fearless group is just folks who are on the registry or or their family and friends who uh, you know. And we we talk about the kinds of challenges and that we face, but also successes. You know, it's a it's a way to support one another in overcoming the obstacles that are put in front of us. Um, so having that sense of community, and I'm not alone in this, is important. And, you know, get involved. It doesn't matter if it's stuffing envelopes once every three months to get newsletters out to the prison, or if it's visiting legislators. Um, Parsol has a number of committees that folks can get involved in if you're interested in legislation, um, education, support, uh, legal issues, um, and we're always open to more ideas, new ideas, and it doesn't have, I mean, I, of course, encourage people to contact Parcel to get involved. However, you know, if there's another organization who's doing the same kind of works, either nationally, or even if there's some local organization I don't know about, get involved. You know, it, it doesn't have to be Parcel, certainly, but to, but to do, and really and truly little teeny tiny things matter. They really matter. Little things add up to be quite a lot. Um, and would, would just really, you know, the supports are there. There's people to talk to. There are, there's lots of work to do if you want to roll up your sleeves. And if you've only got the time and energy for a little, that's great too. Yeah, well said. And as far as uh, other organizations, uh, United Voices for Change comes to mind. They, they're they national and they focus on these issues. And uh, mm -hmm. there's some Pennsylvania presence there. Uh, yeah. Families Against Mandatory Minimums, they've been a great ally. And, you know, they get it as far as uh, yeah. uh, the challenges for, for this population, people with sex offenses, uh, mm -hmm. uh, war, there's, there's, women against the registry. Mm -hmm. And Narsol. Yep. All great allies, and of course, Parcel. If if you want to keep it local, keep it in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, so, Teresa, you already answered this question uh, in some ways, but uh, how would you how would you tell people to get involved? What, what do they do? What do they call? Where do they go if they want to get involved? Um, so, if they want to get involved, you can go to um, Parcel. If, if you want to get involved with Parcel, go to par parcel.org. Um, there are, there's a telephone number there. If you want to talk with someone directly, there's no one will answer, but you can leave a message and someone from Parcel will get back to you. Um, you, there's a volunteer, um, tab. You can fill that out and it will go to our volunteer coordinator who will contact you to see if you can get involved on that level. Um, nationally, same thing, narsal.org. 
if you wanted to do work at a higher, not a higher level, but a broad, more broad level in terms of the, the reach of Narsal. Um, yeah. Um, so I think you're more familiar with our uh, social media things and would give, turn that over to you in terms of, I, we do have a Twitter page, a Facebook. I'm not sure if we have Instagram, but if you could let people know about how to access those platforms. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, all that information that'll be in the description here on the, the YouTube video, including our phone number and our mailing address, if you prefer to get in touch with us that way, parcel.org, of course, is the, the place to go for all those links. And yep, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. So uh, don't be a stranger. Teresa, thanks, uh, thanks again for your years of service and uh, your wisdom and your time today. And uh, I hope we'll talk again about treatment and other uh, issues surrounding this population in PA. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I, I hope that one of the things you guys have in the works in terms of um, these kinds of um, information dissemination uh, activities is to focus in on your own amazing work uh, with the with the Pennsylvania legislature and being able to share your wisdom in in that area. Yeah, I'd like that too for uh, for another interview. Maybe you won't mind interviewing me. No, sounds good. Great. All right. All right, doctor. Good talking to you. I'll see you around. All right. Bye, Randall. Thank you. <laughs>